Well, we're going to shift gears a little bit. Our scripture this morning comes from Genesis 37. It's a familiar story, I think, to a lot of us, but uh, we know the story, but we often don't know a lot of the background or some of the details of the background. So this is an abridged version of the beginning part of the story that I'm going to read through. See what kind of stands out to you as you think about family and what it is to be family and some of the good examples of family and maybe in this scripture some of the not so good examples of family. The story of Jacob continues with Joseph, 17 years old at the time, helping out his brothers in herding the flocks. These were his half-brothers, actually, the sons of his father's wives, Bilhah and Zilpah. And Joseph brought his father bad reports on them. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was a child of his old age. And he made him an elaborately embroidered coat. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. They wouldn't even speak to him. Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat. All of a sudden, my bundle stood straight up, and your bundle circled around it and bowed down to mine. His brothers said, so, you're going to rule us? You're going to boss us around? And they hated him more than ever because of his dreams and the way he talked. His brothers had gone off to Shechem where they were pastoring their father's flocks. Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers are with flocks in Shechem. Come, I want to send you to them. Joseph said, I'm ready. They, the brothers, spotted him off in the distance. By the time he got to them, he, they had cooked up a plot to kill him. Reuben heard the brothers talking and intervened, intervened to save him. We're not going to kill him. No murder. Go ahead and throw him in the cistern out here in the wild, but don't hurt him. Reuben planned to go back later and get him out and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off the fancy coat he was wearing, grabbed him, and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was dry. There wasn't any water in it. Then they sat down to eat their supper. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way from Gilead, their camels loaded with spices, ointments, and perfumes to sell in Egypt. Judah said, Brothers, what are we going to get out of killing our brother and concealing the evidence? Let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, but let's not kill him. He is, after all, our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. His brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph with them down to Egypt. They took Joseph's coat, butchered a goat, and dipped the coat in the blood. They took the fancy coat back to their father and said, We found this. Look it over. Do you think this is your son's coat? He recognized it at once. My son's coat. A wild animal has eaten him. Joseph torn limb from limb. Jacob tore his clothes in grief, dressed in rough burlap, and mourned his son a long, long time. It's not always easy to be part of a family, especially one like that. Now, on the pews in front of you, every week there are these yellow cards. They're meant for notes of encouragement, but sometimes, you know, we'll be thumbing through there, we'll be cleaning up after Sunday, and we'll find to-do lists or grocery lists, and, and that's okay. I, I'm, no, I'm not trying to shame anybody here. But we came across one just a couple of weeks ago that I'd like to share this morning. I have no idea who wrote this, but listen. Mom always wants me to come to church, then gets mad because we act like idiots. Can't have it both ways, Mom. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. There's so much to unpack here in only so little time. But mom is working to bring the family together. And this kid, I don't know who, it, I'm, I'm assuming a kid. Uh, could be an adult, I guess. That would make it even better. Um, 
This kid and his or her sibling are participating, but obviously with some reservation. It's true to life, and it also epitomizes how difficult it can be sometimes to bring our families together. You know, as I've been thinking about this worship series, there have some, been some big questions that have come to mind. Questions like, what does God really want for our families? What does God hope we will be, who we will be, especially in the toughest of the tough times? What is God drawing us towards as family units, no matter how those family units are assembled or defined? Remember last week, we concluded that a perfect family, if there is such a thing, has nothing to do with class, race, number of parents, or even blood relation. It has everything to do, though, with love and support and commitment, accountability with compassion. So we know that God wants that for our families. God wants our families to be places of love and support and protection, environments where every person of the family can grow and grow together. But what I realized is that that can't really happen unless we have some sense, and hopefully a strong sense, of togetherness. Now, like I said with the kids earlier in my failed attempt to do the uh, sit-down lap exercise, was that there are a number of ways to think about togetherness. We can think about togetherness as simply being, sharing the same place at the same time, but there's also this sort of practical togetherness, what we might call being on the same page, right? We want to be on the same page. We want to be pointed in the same direction, working toward the same goals. That's another kind of togetherness that we can share. There's emotional togetherness. When we talk about the togetherness that we feel when we come here, maybe on a Sunday morning, hopefully it's an emotional connectedness. It's an emotional togetherness. We have a close feeling, a feeling of intimacy with one another. There's another kind of, uh, of togetherness. It's a sort of, I don't know what to call it, but maybe other than a committed togetherness. That no matter how far physically we might be from one another, that when we come together physically, we will have that same connection. We all have friends like this, maybe who we went to school with. The minute you get back in the same room with them, it's like no time has passed. And even when they're far away, we know that they will have our back. There's that kind of togetherness as well. We know that we're better together, simply put. Now, before I go on, I do want to give a quick disclaimer. I don't think that God wants us to be together at all costs. If a member of a family is abusive, if a member of a family is trying to rip out the seams of the family, space is necessary. And as always, we say this and we say it frequently, if you find yourself in a situation where you or your family needs help, we as pastors are always here for you. We will help, and we will help you find the help that you need. Another word of clarification. Togetherness is not codependency. We must function together, but also apart from one another. Family should be places of preparation, nests where we can then fly off. So, speaking of dysfunction in families... Let's go back to the scripture for just a moment. Joseph, thrown into a pit by his brothers, then sold into slavery. Well, he is our brother after all. I love that line. He is our brother after all. We can't kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. You have that. You have this big lie to dad about Joseph being killed. All that, though, we need to be careful about not reading this as a straight-up morality tale about family togetherness while at the same time noting some of the things that break families down. Favoritism. It says pretty clearly the father didn't hold back on his favoritism for Joseph. And then you have Joseph's lack of sensitivity in the matter. Pro tip from a pastor. If you're daddy's favorite and you have a dream that all of your brothers are bowing down and worshiping you, keep it to yourself. And then, of course, the brothers' jealousy, greed, flat-out cruelty, and lying. Serious harm done to relationships and togetherness. 
Now, if, if, all, if those are some of the things that break down family togetherness, what are the things that create family togetherness? Well, that's actually where we're going to turn to our clip of the day. It's from the television show called Blackish. A little bit about Blackish. Blackish is a critically acclaimed sitcom. It's on ABC. It's created by Kenya Barris. For the last five years, it's followed an upper middle class African American family led by anesthetist, I practice saying that words multiple times, anesthetist Rainbow Johnson and her husband, who is an advertising executive, Andre Johnson. The show revolves around the family's lives, as you would guess, as they juggle socio-political issues, normal family stuff, some of the nuances of being an African-American family. But of course, at the heart of it is not that they are a black family, but that they're a family who happens to be black. They are a family first and foremost. And of course, that is where the comedy gold lies. In the clip that we're going to watch here in a minute, Father Andre is trying to instill in his kids the importance of being together and family togetherness. Go ahead and roll it, guys. Keeping a large family together has its challenges, and lately, it seems like... Everybody's doing their own thing. <laughs> hey, game night! I got Cranium and Jenga! I also have Bananagram. Closed doors were not an option when I was growing up. Put that back when you move out. But then I won't need it. Keep talking, I'll take this whole room apart. When I was growing up, you weren't allowed to separate yourself from your family, which is why I try to find ways to remind my kids that they're a part of something greater than themselves. Hey, babe, check this out. Look what I got today. Oh, those are so cute. Yeah, right? The kids are going to hate them. Uh, maybe, but they will hate them together. Hey, hey, slow your roll. I need to talk to you two. Look, I want us to start operating more like a team around here, spending more time together, appreciating each other. Dad, are you dying? No, fool. Look, we're all going to support Jack at his baseball game, and we're all going to wear these t-shirts to show family unity. Oh, that sounds great. Except I'm not wearing the shirt or going to the game. Okay. What I have to say to that is, wear the shirt or be grounded. Can we take a minute to huddle? Okay. What I have to say to that is wear the shirt or eat it. We're still gonna need that minute. Two and one, Edwin Groff. Okay, so when it's your turn next, you focus, Jack, okay? Focus, JJ. I should have eaten the shirt. I should have gotten adopted by Madonna. I should have peed at home. I think they're using a different brand of hot dog. I didn't hear. I know we could watch it all day, right? So to create a sense of family togetherness, Dre buys his family now. these matching t-shirts, and then he forces them to attend the one son's baseball game under the threat of being grounded, of course, and then even eating the shirt. Dad has assembled them physically together, but it's clear that they're not really together. They're not on the same page, like we like to say. You know? There will always be times like this in family life. Guys, I'm not going to do the second clip. We could, we could skip that one if you're holding it. Or you got it. You got it. Well, awesome. All right. Okay. Family Togetherness, part two, same episode. What's some Chucky Monkey? I need it. I'm bored. I want to be entertained. Oh, then why don't we play a game? Follow me. 
tree stand right there. Close your eyes. I'm gonna be an awesome mom. She should not have children. Hey, Junior, can we play? Guess we have to entertain ourselves. You thinking what I'm thinking? Okay, here we go. Are you crazy? You can't let them ride down the stairs like that. They need helmets. Okay, let's get one thing straight. None of this was my fault. All right. The kids are finally getting their untogetherness, you know, nothing like a little. How many of us have been in that situation before as kids, right? Shh, don't tell mom. If only life were as simple as a sitcom. A new United Nations report came out this week. The number of refugees and displaced people has hit an all-time global high. Almost 71 million people. People just like you and me, displaced by wars, insecurity, famine, hunger. People with families, in other words. Imagine having to make that decision, the decision of whether to stay or whether to leave. Imagine when a family needs to decide whether one or some will go and one or some will stay to protect their home. Imagine when communication is then sparse or non-existent. Imagine when a family gets to an international border and then children are taken from parents. Regardless of the legality or illegality of border crossing, separating children from parents is wrong. We know this. This past Monday, this group of brave souls, right from here, right from this very congregation, as part of our Immigration Support Committee, went down to Washington, D.C., and we met with Sen the offices of Senator Casey, Senator, Toom Senator Toom Toomey, and Congressman Smucker. We went and we shared with the staff people why this is an important issue for us as people of faith. For us as people who want to strengthen families, who want to support families, who believe that every human being is made in God's image. Because families belong together. Now these are group, this is a group of people who have voted as Democrats and Republicans and Independents. None of that matters. Families belong together. You know, I never finished the story of Joseph and his brothers. In the end, family togetherness saved the day for a family who was refugees indeed. When famine gripped the land, Joseph's brothers went to Egypt to buy grain. Unbeknownst to them, Joseph, who had been, remember, sold off to Egypt, had ascended to become the Pharaoh's right-hand man. Long story short, Joseph forgives them, saves his brothers and their families from famine, and the whole family is together again, not only physically, but also in spirit and direction. Families belong together. So, mom always wants me to come to church, then we act like idiots. It happens. I don't know though, Mom. Maybe you can have it both ways. In next week's episode, we're going to continue to celebrate what it means to be a family together, and we're going to start to expand that definition beyond just our immediate families to what it's like and what it means for us as a congregation to be what's often referred to as a family of faith. I invite you to stand for our closing hymn.